Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good morning. Good Christ, you're here on a Saturday morning. <laughs> it could be so many other places. Wow. Well, welcome. Is this anyone's first time to a mosque? Wow. Wow. I think that means we've already succeeded, so I can go home. <laughs> what about lunch? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to miss lunch. Them. That's right. That's right. That is why we all came here. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I was saying you don't want to miss it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, really, uh, I think we have already succeeded in, in, to a notable extent. Uh, you know, our goal is to, to make this world a more beautiful place. And uh, you coming here ha has already done that. And so you guys have made this a successful... We can all come here, but if you guys don't come here, you guys are reaching out bold, and, and, and it's very meaningful to us, and it's very touching for us. It's very touching for us. Um, hopefully we can together make this country a more beautiful place. I mean, amen. Hopefully we can make this a more beautiful place for all of us. So this, this country's on a journey, we're, on, we're, we're individuals, we're on a journey, and hopefully our contributions to that journey will be one of love and light. I mean. So, thank you again for, for coming. Today this panel is called The Muslim Next Door. The Muslim Next Door. So, uh, last week, my, daughter, my two daughters came home and they said that the neighbor called them little brats. So that's the typical Muslim neighbor, little brats. I'm just joking. So they came home, and they said, it was an 8-year-old and 6-year-old, and they said, Baba, this lady in a white car, she called us little brats. They're like, what's a brat? And I was like, it's a sweet, darling little princess. And then I was like, what happened? She, they said, well, we were playing, and we shouted a little loud. And then she, and then she called us little brats. I was like, do you know who it was? And, uh, and they're like, yeah. I was like, all right, let's take some eggs and toilet paper. <laughs> and then I was like, no. All right, do you know who it was? They said, yeah. I was like, all right, we have to go give her a gift. Go get your arts and crafts kit, write him a letter, draw her a picture, and let's get a gift. So we went to Little Bunt Cakes. Isn't that what it's mm -hmm. called? Yeah. Nothing, but nothing but cakes. <laughs> we got her a... Uh, we got her a small nothing bun cake, and, and then we went, and I was like, which house is it? And they put their little cards in there with all these little sweethearts, and love, I love you. They didn't even know who she is, but they love her. <laughs> you know, kids know how to love more than adults do. May we remember how to love like they do. May we remember how to forgive like they do. Amen. So then we put them in a bag, and we walked, and I was like, which house is it? And they said, it's this house. And so... Um, rang the doorbell, and, I, and then I looked at them, and I was like, is this it? And, like, no. <laughs> and I was like, hi, we're just here to say hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> and the gift was like hidden. <laughs> and then we went to the second house, and I was like, you sure? Like, I think so. <laughs> we rang the doorbell, and someone opened. Is this it? They're like, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. So then, <laughs> hi. <laughs> then we went to the third house, and uh, it was cool how they remembered it. But and we rang the doorbell, and uh, me and my eight-year-old and six-year-old, and, and we rang the doorbell, and uh, and then and then this lady came out, and and then and then I was like, is that her? They're like, no. And they're like, she's like, how can I help you? I'm like, well, my daughters were playing last week, and they were a little noisy, and there was an elderly lady, and um, and we just wanted to express our um, apologies for you know making her uncomfortable. We brought a little gift. She's like, oh, that was my sister-in-law. She was visiting me, and she drove, and she said she felt bad because she <laughs> yelled at two little girls. <laughs> She called them little brats, and she felt bad. And I was like, well, they have something for her. And then they said, hey, this is for her, and they gave her a little gift. And that's our, and that's our goal, to be the Muslim next door. And that's what we try to embody. Um, 
Martin Luther King said, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. Uh, in the Islamic tradition, we have a saying of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, where he said, I, I can cure the blind and the leper, but I can't cure compound ignorance. Uh, so, uh, today, our, the way we have this set up, the first part is, is the myth-busting. The myth busters. So we have two myth busters. And that is to say when uh, the illusion of knowledge, well there's, there's some ideas maybe generally associated uh, with, uh, with Islam and Muslims which are not true. And so uh, today hopefully we want to unravel some of those to bring out the truth. And, at, and that's the first part. The second segment, uh, which is arguably the core of today's session, is what is Islam? So the first segment is what isn't Islam. The second is what is Islam? And that will answer the question of who are Muslims and, and who are they and what do they believe and what do they do? And then finally the third part is a journey of intertwining how can we be both beautiful Americans and beautiful Muslims? Intertwining of a story of how we can live in this country and they're not mutually exclusive. So that's a general framework. We'll then take a break, uh, have, uh, have a stretch break. We'll take a break and then we'll have questions and answers. And we have note cards for anyone. And, and we invite everyone to, to bring forth their heart today. Bring your mind, bring your heart, bring yourself. And let's make this a meaningful, genuine, authentic intersection of our lives today. So our first panelist is our dear Hina, sitting right here in the middle, in the green. And Hina is an accomplished uh, teacher, writer, and she has, is a mother of three young men. Uh, and she has been a, a teacher for many years. And uh, without further ado, please welcome Hina Muhtar. I'd like to reiterate Mandy's uh, welcome and also thank you for joining us today. This means a lot whenever we see that we're able to fill more than three seats. <laughs> so the reason why we're here today and why we're so grateful that you came to join us is that we have the very awesome task of trying to facilitate a significant shift in people's understanding of Islam and Muslims. And our goal today isn't to proselytize, nor is it to comment with our own personal opinions about politics or even about different aspects of our religion. We're not here representing all Muslims, certainly as many Muslims as you will meet. That's how many different stories and perspectives you're going to encounter as well. The perspective that each of us on this panel shares today is that we are all committed to what is called traditional Islam. As with any religion, you're going to find splinter groups and sects that are going to develop over the years. And Islam is not any different. We have some different offshoots that have come up over the years, like the Ahmadis and the Afghanis and the Nation of Islam, just to name a few. Each of these offshoots is certainly influenced by the original traditional teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But their core <coughs> beliefs and tenets of faith have changed so much over time that they're virtually unrecognizable today from when compared to orthodox mainstream Islam. And they also have very few followers when compared to the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world today. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was known to have said, my nation, meaning his followers, my nation will never err in the majority. So stick with the majority. Our aim is to practice Islam according to what the majority of the scholars of the religion uphold to be correct and true. So this majority makes up what is considered to be traditional Sunni Islam, the mainstream. So that's the viewpoint we're going to be representing today. So along with explaining what Islam is, which is the task that Dr. Asad is going to be taking on, we feel that it's critical for people to also understand what Islam is not. And that's my goal today. So since I want to be 
respectful of the other panelists' time, I'm going to try to tackle only two main myths that I often get asked about in interfaith discussions. And I'm hopeful that we can tackle some of the other common myths that may be on people's minds during Q&A. So the first myth I'd like to cover is Sharia is coming to take over America. <laughs> so I was at an interfaith gathering in a church in Danville, and we were taking questions from the audience members, and this lady stood up, and she said the thing that she was the most upset about was that Sharia was here in the country, and that now our laws and courts were being, making decisions based on Sharia law, and no longer based on the Constitution. And I didn't even know where to begin with this. <laughs> it was obvious that she was pretty distressed, and her voice was shaking, and she was pretty emotional about it. So if you were to regularly watch the evening news, or certain evening news, it'd be natural to believe the propaganda that Muslims, or today's boogeymen, after all, are here to take over the land with their different ways of thinking and believing and living. But actually, nothing could be farther from the truth. So simply put, Sharia is a moral code. And before it's a legal code, it's a moral code. So Sharia is more concerned with sin than it actually than with crime. So for example, if I tell a lie to my friend, there's no earthly law that's going to hold me accountable for telling a lie to my friend. But according to Sharia, I know that God will hold me accountable on the day of judgment for telling lies. And so it's Sharia that will tell me that I'm not allowed to be dishonest or deceitful. Um, we worship God with our minds, our bodies, and our souls. And Sharia is concerned with the physical aspect of our lives. So it defines all the aspects of a Muslim's conduct and actions. It dictates everything from what we eat, to how we dress, to how we worship, to the rules of marriage and divorce, the rules of financial transactions and inheritance, the rules of what is allowed for us and what isn't, what is required of us and what is forbidden. So one thing people may not realize is that Islam actually does not allow for anarchy or chaos. We, as Muslims, have to have some form, some system of government in place, and we have to live under it, even if it's not a Muslim one. And we're required to respect and obey the the laws of the land. It's called so, a, that if we ever run a red light on a pur on purpose, that we actually have to ask God to forgive us because we broke a law that we had said we were going to follow when we passed our driving tests. <coughs> and so Sharia tells us that if we can't practice our religion in peace and safety, and if we aren't happy with the laws of the land, then we need to migrate from that country. The highest law of the land in the United States of America is the Constitution. So according to our own Sharia, Muslims are required to respect the Constitution. And if we don't, then we're supposed to leave. And believe you me, with everything that's going on right now in the political landscape right now, there is no one more concerned with protecting the Constitution than Muslim Americans. So what about penal code punishments? That's the big elephant in the room. That's what people are usually thinking about when they want to ask about Sharia. They think of beheadings, cutting off of hands, whippings, stonings, etc. So yes, there is a penal code within the Sharia. And just like the United States law has capital punishments for certain offenses, Sharia law also includes a form of capital punishment. But the important differences between capital punishment in American law and capital punishment in Sharia law are two. The first is that the penal code is first and foremost meant as a deterrent. It's not actually meant to be implemented. And the second is that the evidence required to establish proof of a punishable crime makes the punishment almost impossible to implement. For example, the penal code for adultery is death. However, the evidence required to prove adultery is for witnesses who actually see the act. So as you can see, the punishment is there, but it is first and foremost meant as a deterrent. Muslims knowing that adultery, the punishment for his death, tells them how serious this crime or this sin is in the eyes of God. So it's actually meant to 
ensure that these types of crimes or sins that affect society at large are not being done out in the open and they're not becoming the norm. Now, if we want to look at how Sharia is actually implemented, we can look at the Ottoman Empire, which was by Sunni Muslims considered to be the last legitimate Muslim government that ruled a large portion of the world for almost 700 years. And the punishment for adultery during that time, 700 years, was only implemented once. And even after that one time, the scholars protested it, and so it ended up never being repeated again. The other very important fact for people to understand is that according to Sharia itself, the laws of Sharia can only be applied and upheld when there is a legitimate Muslim government in power. And a majority of Muslim scholars today are in agreement that no such government currently exists in the world. And therefore, there's no official body which has the authority to implement the penal code punishments, which, by the way, only make up 0.1% of the body of Sharia law. So unfortunately, when one hears the word Sharia law, they just only imagine grisly capital punishments. So when you do see those horrific images on YouTube or on the internet or hear stories of those types of quote-unquote punishments, you should know that Muslims actually consider that to be vigilantism. And it's in no way sanctioned in Islam, and it's actually forbidden by our scholars and our jurists. So before moving on to the next myth, I'd like to share with you all what are called the maqasid of sharia, meaning the principles or the foundations of sharia. We believe that all sharia laws are divinely inspired, and therefore they're the perfect set of laws for mankind. And upon close study of sharia, you'll find that each and every part of sharia is meant to protect one of six things. So the first is the right to religion. You can't force anyone to convert. The second is right to life. You can't kill anyone unjustly. The third is the right to family and lineage. Everyone has a right to know where they come from. The fourth is the right to honor. You can't slander or lie or backbite about people. It's a tabloid journalism would be out. <laughs> the fifth is the right to intellect and reason, so you can't take intoxicants that affect your ability to reason and think. Anesthesia during surgery has its own set of rulings, so Sharia has nuance to it. And the sixth is the right to property, you can't steal, usurp wealth, or cheat anyone out of what's theirs. So that was the first myth. The second myth is that women are oppressed in Islam. Yes, just like anywhere else in the world, including the United States of America, there are some Muslim women who are oppressed, and there are some Muslim-majority countries that do have a cultural that do have a culture that is more favorable to men. And there are stories of domestic abuse in some Muslim households, part of the human family. But the real question is: Does Islam teach, condone, or in any way support the oppression of women? And the answer is absolutely not. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the best of you are the ones who are the best to their women. The majority of the focus of this last sermon was on the rights of women. And Muslims believe in the story of Adam and Eve, just like the Jews and the Christians. But in Islam, Eve, is this still working? But in Islam, Eve is not held accountable for Adam's mistakes. They're both held equally responsible. So she's not the one to blame. She's not considered to be a temptress. And she's not the reason that kind lost paradise. So there seem to be a few reasons that Islam gets this bad rap. The first is the hijab, the head covering. Hijab actually doesn't mean head covering. It means barrier. And, but it's become shorthand for headscarf, and it's fine to use that word now. So it actually means barrier, and it sets up boundaries for interaction. It's the first thing people see, and they don't understand it. They don't necessarily think of the Virgin Mary when they see the headscarf. They usually wonder, why do women wear it? Men don't have to cover their heads. Men also have parts of their bodies that they have to cover. They have to cover from the navel to the knee. So they can't wear speedos, they can't expose their kneecaps or their thighs or their belly buttons. So why are there different rules? 
Well, we have different rules here in America as well. If we were going jogging in the park right now, and it was a hot day, a man could <clears throat> take off his shirt if he's getting hot and sweaty. A woman couldn't. She would be arrested for public indecency. So we believe that our rules for how we dress are divinely inspired, and that God understands what is best for us, since He is our creator after all. The second thing people see is when they come to the mosques and they may see the congregational prayer, they'll often see that the women are praying behind the men. And they may think of it in the framework of Rosa Parks, sitting at the back of the bus. But where you pray in the congregational prayer doesn't give any indication of your closeness to God. Islam gives both men and women equal access to getting to God, to getting to paradise, to getting to his divine pleasure. The prayer is intimate. We stand together, shoulder to shoulder, and we stand, bow, and prostrate on the ground with our bottoms in the air. And most women would not feel comfortable having men standing behind them, watching them as they bow down with their bottoms up in the air. So it's really about privacy and modesty. That's the reason you'll see the women lined up behind the men. And the point of prayer is to focus on God and your relationship with Him, not on where you're standing or whom you're standing next to. And then the third thing related to women is that people often confuse how women are treated in countries like Saudi Arabia with how Islam treats women in general. Now the fact that women only just started driving in Saudi Arabia in 2018 is due to a Saudi law, not an Islamic law. Muslim women have been heads of state in Muslim majority countries. One of the current vice presidents in Iran is a woman. Even women in the United States haven't managed to shatter that glass ceiling yet. The two holiest cities in Islam, Mecca and Medina, <coughs> happen to be in the land that is currently called Saudi Arabia. However, Saudi Arabia does not hold religious authority over the world's population of Muslims. Their government can make whatever laws they want to, but that doesn't give them legitimacy over the world's population of Muslims. So those were two myths I wanted to cover about Sharia and women. And then during Q&A, we'll be able to tackle some of the other ones. I'm going to hand it over. Back to Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone know how many Muslims serve in the United States Armed Forces? A lot. Almost about 5,000 <coughs> currently today Muslim Americans serve in the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, the, the next part of our panel is by a graduate of the United States Naval Academy who served uh, in the Navy and uh, it's Mike Kim. Uh, Mike also uh, works in real estate, uh, is a father of seven children, uh, lives locally, and uh, um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> My name's Mehdi. I, I, live, I live here. I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 14 years, uh, married, I have three daughters. I also graduated from the first Oh, I have a, yeah, I just had a baby three weeks ago. We won't tell them. I've been up all night, sorry. I felt bad for my wife. I was like, 4 a.m., she's like, can you take him, please? I was like, yeah, I can take him. So I took him downstairs, and I'm like, come on, dude, go to sleep. Go to sleep. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> I've also been blessed to graduate from the first ever Muslim liberal, accredited liberal arts college in America. It's located in Berkeley, California. The first ever in the history of America and in the history of the Western Hemisphere. Right here in Berkeley, California. And all of you are invited to visit. If you're going to visit, send an email to Munir, MCC, he'll send it to me, I'll, I'll, I will give you a tour. Happy to have you there any day uh, in Berkeley, California, at the top of Holy Hill, along with other sister universities and other theological seminaries. So Mike Kim is going to address uh, the next major issue of what Islam is not, and that is the, the, the I will let him introduce you. Please welcome Mike Kim. 
Okay. All right. Hi. So I'm going to talk about uh, ISIS and jihad. But before I do, uh, I want to just share with you how I came to Islam because it's intertwined and why I had such interest in matters of war. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I was a student at Annapolis, we had this assignment where we were we were assigned to uh, summarize the, the biographies of all the eminent scientists and philosophers of the Western civilization, so it's quite a task. So I was in the library, flipping through the book, and then came across this passage, and it, and it really grabbed my attention. It, it basically said that, that the majority of these materialists and scientists and philosophers in the Western civilization were believers in the transcendental, which is a, an academic neutral term for God, that the world was a created universe. So that was an extraordinary statement that the most revered and widely studied and respected minds in the Western civilization were believers in a God, that their life's work uh, uh, were inspired by their desire to know the created universe. So like when Isaac Newton talks about the origin of motion, you have to understand the point at which you know Allah created, God created the universe. When you know Rene Descartes was 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 uh, studying the Cartesian coordinates, you have to understand the geometric uh, relationship of, of the created universe. So it really opened up a new horizon for me. So from that point, I, I launched on a personal quest, if you will, to find out what this is all about, because nobody had told me such, nobody had made that connection in the past. So oh, through my remaining years at the Naval Academy, I, I read and I researched and I talked to people. I did the best I can to get my uh, uh, answer to questions that I had. And, and in so doing, I walked away with a certain standard or criteria, whether it was social, philosophical, or spiritual, or scientific, on, the, on what type of religion that I would adopt. For example, the scientific standard. I felt that since we're talking about the created universe, that revelation must necessarily be ahead of all scientific discoveries. That, that in no circumstance should science debunk revelation. Right? So I found that uh, standard quite challenging from most of the world religions, except Islam. Islam answered those questions and, and there's just all sorts of scientific proofs in Islam that we're still trying to discover and, and, and come to a better understand. I'll just give you one quick example. I was a navigator in the Navy and it's still a bit of a mystery of how certain bodies of water don't intermingle the salinity content, temperature gradient, uh, the pressure. You know, for example, the way that the, the Mediterranean flows into the Atlantic there's a pressure gradient difference causing weather, weather disturbances, etc. The Quran talks about that from an illiterate prophet 1600 years ago who's never seen the ocean, right? So, so there's hundreds of these types of scientific proofs, and again, other standards, whether social or it, it, it met my standard, therefore I became a Muslim. Now, as such, because I was a military uh, naval officer or aspiring naval officer, I was very interested in what Islam had to say about the conduct of war. Mm -hmm. Because war, we, we were taught at Annapolis, if, if, if combat is not conducted with the highest of, of moral standards, you will literally lose your humanity on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Because it's the most brutal act that human beings can engage in, and if you don't live and, 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 and conduct war by a certain moral code, you will literally become an animal. So, you know, PTSD, all of these are symptoms of, of, of our soldiers Experiencing extreme duress and distress in combat. Um, anyways, there's volumes of, of books written about this subject matter. You can you know, look it up yourself. But that's why it's so important. So I was curious, what does Islam say about war? Well, it turns out that Islam uh, says quite a bit about it. And and what I discovered is that they had a very refined and high standard regarding uh, uh, the reasons for war and the conduct during war. Uh, in the Quran it says that permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made because they have been wronged. Those who have been driven out from their homes unjustly only because they said, Our Lord is God. In another verse it says, And if God did not repel some men by means of others, there would surely have been pulled down temples and churches and synagogues and mosques. So those two statements are clear, unequivocal, stating that, that, that fighting is sanctioned under the for, for self-defense, right? And secondly, for the freedom of worship. Notice it doesn't say just mosques, it says synagogues and churches. So all religions were obligated to protect. So the freedom of religion and for self-defense. Those are reasons why it's sanctioned. 
So, and, there, and a lot more is said about it. And, and, and so when I started digging in deeper, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, so you, peace be upon him, had quite a bit to say about uh, 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 war as well. I'll show you just one thing. Uh, and it's what we call today the rules of engagement. The manner in which you engage the enemy. Again, that moral code, right? Because there has to be certain rules and regulations on how you conduct yourself on the battlefield. These were the instructions he gave to his soldiers during war. Taking one step back, by the way, you might ask yourself, well, you're talking about the prophet of God, why would he be, you know, why is he concerned himself about war and conduct and, and combat? Well, we believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final messenger. So as such, he has to be complete in his totality of, of all human aspects, whether you're a brother, a parent, a husband, a son, a businessman, a student, a teacher, and even a warrior. So he exemplified those traits and left us uh, plenty of examples of how to conduct ourselves in, in all of those aspects of, of, of existence. So in matter in a matter in matters of combat, these are the instructions he gave his soldiers. She said, number one, do not harm women, children, elderly, or the sick. Do not commit treachery and never mutilate or disfigure. Do not uproot, cut down, or burn trees. Do not harm any livestock except for food. In combat, avoid striking the face, for God created all of us in the image of Adam. Do not kill monks in monasteries, and do not kill those sitting in places of worship. Do not destroy the villages and towns. Do not spoil the cultivated fields and gardens. So in other words, you can't starve people out during war. Do not wish for an encounter with the enemy. Pray to God to grant you security. But when you are forced to encounter them, exercise patience. No one may punish with, the, with fire except the Creator. So in Islam, weapons of mass destruction, chemical, nuclear, napalm, all of those will be for, forbidden. And finally, accustom yourself to do good and do not do wrong even if they commit. So, you know, <clears throat> taken in totality, there are no other rules of engagement that I've come across during my time as a naval officer that, are, that were higher standards than those. None. You know, there, the Nuremberg trials, the Geneva Conventions, post-World War II, uh, lessons learned, all those embody today what we in the U.S. military utilize for the, uh, what we believe is the highest standards of rules of engagement. Those 10 things I just rattled off to you is the highest standard of came across. Okay, so let me just now talk about jihad. So the term jihad in Arabic uh, does not in and of itself have anything to do with what we all think it is. Okay, jihad comes from the root word jihad, which means to make an effort. So consequently, the highest form of jihad is to struggle with your own self, with your own ego. Right? That's the highest form of jihad. The lesser form of jihad is the, the, the military component. Um, and by the way, jihad is not, when they say holy war, we don't, that's, that doesn't ring true with us because we see nothing holy in war. It, it, there's nothing holy about it. It's, it's, just, it's, the, it's the means of last resort, if you will. Um, so again, just to give you a couple examples on the greater versus lesser jihad, um, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the best jihad is to speak truth to a tyrannical leader. <laughs> And in another instance, he said, perform jihad by serving your parents. And there's on and on, all again, about you know, being the best human being as you can. That's the higher form of jihad, the lesser form being the military component. Okay, let me do uh, ISIS. So ISIS, um, you know, we believe that they're vigilantes. Um, it's what happened, ISIS, by the way, there was no ISIS prior to the Iraq war. We all, I hope we all know that. Uh, we created a power vacuum by invading Iraq and then leaving. And that power vacuum is filled by this uh, vigilante group called ISIS. So it would be the equivalent of, let's say Russia came and invaded our country and left. So who would fill the power vacuum? If they destroyed our police apparatus and security and government system? The Mississippi militia, right? They're the ones with the weapons and organized and have a cause. So, and somebody in some other part of the world would call them crazies. So it's a, it's a, it's a geopolitical phenomenon, the rise of ISIS. They, they are not sanctioned at all by the, the, the broader Muslim community. The, the easiest way to look at it is, ISIS is to Islam what the KKK is to Christianity. Or maybe what fascism is to Christianity. Right? I mean, I read Mein Kampf and, and Hitler invokes a lot of Christian you know, thinking and, and, and theology on reasons of why he's doing what he's doing. 
right? So it's similarly, ISIS is, 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 a, is an extreme aberration of, of our religion, and not within our fold. Um, that's it. All I got. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, for that. <coughs> Glad I didn't have to talk about that. <laughs> uh, the next segment is uh, arguably the core of what what is the the today's session, and that is by Dr. Esad Tarsin who is an ER physician uh, in Walnut Creek uh, practicing. Uh, I say he saves bodies at night and he saves souls in the day. Uh, he's an author of a groundbreaking text. It's called Being Muslim, A Practical Guide. Uh, this is a text written for Americans, by Americans, for and the ones who's journeying to God. And it's a comprehensive overview of what it means uh, and how to journey to God. Uh, so the point of departure for a Muslim is we come from God and how do we go to God? And, and Dr. Esad will answer that question for us. Please welcome Dr. Esad Tarsi. Thank you and good morning. How's everyone doing so far? Good. Good. Well. Okay. Um, so, uh, my task is that within the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the religion of Islam. Uh, yeah? Okay. Uh, 20. All right. So, uh, a, a little bit of breathing room. Um, so, what I'd like to do is hopefully give an overview on a conceptual level, not getting down into specifics, but more giving you a bird's eye view um, to sort of look at what the... The, the, the box of the puzzle look, you know, shows you that, that image, because um, sometimes we can look at individual pieces and, and lose sight of, of what the whole thing is. So um, that's, that's my uh, hope here today. So first I'd like to start with some definitions. Um, so first two, what does the, the term Islam mean? So Islam is the proper name of the religion itself. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, I am. <laughs> I'm going to stand just because I, I kind of need to see where the slides are, so, <laughs> with your permission. Uh, it's the proper name of the religion itself, right? So uh, it's a word that means literally to turn oneself over to, right? Uh, it is to surrender over to, and it means obviously to surrender oneself over to God. A Muslim is therefore one who has surrendered himself or herself over to God. Uh, it's uh, one who achieves, and, and the word Islam also comes from a root word that means peace. Um, so you sometimes you might have heard that phrase where some people say Islam actually means peace. Yeah, the word Salam, and even the Hebrew Shalom in Semitic languages, means peace. And so what it means is that when a person surrenders him or herself over to God, they attain peace within themselves and, and, uh, and, and are able to uh, emanate that peace throughout, throughout the world, hopefully. Uh, but a Muslim is not a, a person of any specific race or ethnicity. There are people from all walks of life. There's, a, there's Muslims of every ethnicity on earth. And I've got some pictures up here um, to sort of illustrate that, some sort of more famous and well-known uh, people. But you, there's anybody, I mean, the, the, the first one I think is probably one of the most recognizable faces in, in, in modern history. But Muhammad Ali, who we all know of, um, an American uh, Muslim uh, who just passed away just a few years ago, uh, Kat Stevens, who converted and took on the name Yusuf Islam, um, and then Dr. Oz. You, you have many famous um, athletes and, and, and uh, many people that we know that we may not know are Muslim, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessitate any particular uh, race or ethnicity. It's just one who surrenders himself over to God. Another definition I think is important to consider is the word Allah, right? Who is Allah? What does that mean? Is that, is that a deity that Muslims worship? Um, Muslims, it is simply the Arabic name for God, the God of Abraham. Um, the, in, in the Quran, you will see that the, 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 re, the, the returning point for all conversations, particularly with Jews and Christians, is Abraham. Abraham is considered the, the, the father of, of monotheism as we know it, sort of spread around the world. And if you go back to Arabic translations of the Bible, that right there is Genesis in Arabic. And if anyone here could read Arabic, you'd see the fourth word says, 
في البدء خلق الله السماوات والأرض. That in the beginning Allah created the heavens and the earth. Right. So Christians will call upon Allah. So it's simply the Arabic term. It's not a different God. It's the same God that sent Abraham, Noah, uh, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. We we believe that it's the same God. So Muslims uh, often are are uh, framed as worshiping another God, which which is uh, which is false. So how does Islam view itself vis-a-vis -vis other religions is an important question. Uh, like I've already mentioned, Muslims see the returning point uh, of all theological conversation to be Abraham. Um, so they see themselves as continuing and not replacing. They're, they're, they're not, it's interesting, there's actually a verse in the Quran where God says to the Prophet Muhammad, you are not anything new amongst the Prophets. You're not bringing anything new per se. This isn't anything different. Um, but that he is a culmination of the previous messages. Um, so there's a, 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 a one way that some Muslim academics, uh, and actually non-Muslim academics, frame this, that Muslims believe in Islam with a capital I, and that's the religion that we follow here, here in a mosque, but they also believe in an Islam with a lowercase I. That all of these other traditions and previous revelations were manifestations of a surrendering to God of that time. Right? So that if you were a follower of Noah on the ark, that you were in a state of Islam, surrendering to God and following his commandments. And you were therefore a Muslim with the lowercase m, one who was living in surrender to God. If you were with Moses standing against Pharaoh, right, then you were in a state of Islam, surrendering to God, etc. So, um, so that's an important concept that that's not seen as something foreign or different. Um, now there's an interesting... Uh, a uh, parable that the Prophet Muhammad gives, peace be upon him. He says that the parable of my coming is like a beautiful building, and everyone is walking around this beautiful edifice, and they're saying, what a wondrous building, what beautiful architecture, except it's just missing that last brick. And he says, I am that final brick. And so his message to us in that is that this is all a culmination of what previous prophets have brought. That he doesn't, you know, the Prophet Muhammad could have said, um, everything is corrupt, my parable is like a bulldozer that comes and removes everything, but he didn't. He said, I am just that final brick. Um, and so that's, that helps us to understand how Islam views other faith traditions as part of God's plan um, that were uh, an indispensable part of his, of his mission and his coming. There's another interesting tradition in which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, talks about the fact that there was no community on earth in the history of humanity to which God did not send guidance even if we don't know who they are or in what form it took. And he says that the over 124,000 prophets were sent. So the Aborigine, uh, Abor Aboriginal peoples of Australia must have had a prophet that was sent to them. Someone that told them simply about God, the creator of the universe. All of these were different levels of completion. Sometimes it was very basic. Like, for example, the Noahidic laws, right, are much simpler than what Moses brings. Right? The rabbinical legal code is far more complex. But they all include one God, don't kill, don't steal, right? Don't set up idols alongside God. The Ten Commandments are almost something universal to all of the Abrahamic faiths. And in some form exists even in other faith traditions. So in order to understand Islam, and I mean with a capital I now, uh, the religion you came to learn about today, right? There are three main dimensions to learn about the religion, okay? So the quiz at the end of today will be based on these three things, okay? So, uh, faith, conduct, and character. So I'm going to start talking about conduct. So if you've heard of the five, who here has heard of the five pillars of Islam? So the five pillars of Islam, about half of you, the five pillars actually only summarize uh, conduct. So these are actions that a Muslim must perform. These are the five basic uh, rites and rituals that every Muslim has to perform in order to be minimally performed. So the first are the two testimonies of faith. These are the two statements that if a person believes and proclaims, that enters them into Islam. There's no baptism, there's no formal ceremony or anything like that. If a person says, I believe that there's nothing worthy, worship, worthy of worship, save God, and I believe that Muhammad is his last and final messenger, that alone would qualify someone to be a Muslim. Okay, so, but the first pillar is to make that testimony. 
Thereafter, we have five daily prayers based on the position of the sun in relation to where we are. There's a dawn prayer, there's a midday prayer, there's an afternoon prayer, there's a sunset prayer, and then there's a night prayer. And these are five points throughout the day that we spiritually realign ourselves with our purpose and our creator. Uh, one of the amazing things uh, about human beings, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a British Muslim scholar who has a, a, a great proverb who says, how easy it is to forget, how easy it is to forget, right? We're just forgetful beings. We realign and wake up in the morning, okay, God, I'm just, oh, what's my to-do list for today, right? So we have five points of the day in which we realign, we remind ourselves, we recenter, um, and, and, and these things are, are, are there for us to guide us throughout the rest of the day, what it's called. And this is that every Muslim gives 2.5% of their savings, not their income, but their leftover savings, their excess wealth, um, that sits around in a bank account to be given to the uh, to the needy and, and, and the less fortunate. Uh, the fourth is fasting the month of Ramadan. So there's a lunar, we follow a lunar calendar, um, and in, there's a month, it's the ninth month, called Ramadan. And how many people have heard of Ramadan? I'm just, I get curious to know what people are. Okay, that's good. So it's to fast, no water, drink, uh, no food, water, or intimacy um, from dawn until sunset. All right, and that's currently... At a, in, in, a, in about June, May, June right now. So they're, you know, relatively long days. Um, and then the last is the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca. So Mecca is a city, uh, it was alluded to by, by our sister Hina, uh, that it's in modern-day Saudi Arabia. Anybody know who founded the city of Mecca? Any guesses? His name has already been said. Maybe. Abraham. So Abraham, it's actually in the Bible, it's called Mecca with the B. He goes to the holy city of Mecca. And that's where he lives, Ishmael, uh, and, and, and Hagar, right? And there's a famous story of the well that Ishmael finds, etc. That's all there in the Old Testament. But that's where we make pilgrimage to, to the house that was uh, erected by Abraham for the worship of the one God. And that's the holiest site of the psalm. So that's conduct. Those are five ritual devotions that every Muslim must practice and be committed to as a minimum. Um, then there are faith. Then, the, then there's faith. Not things that we do but things that we believe, okay? These are things, this is surrendering to God with our bodies, but then also with our mind, right? Things that we believe are mental conceptions. If you believe the earth is flat or you believe the earth is a sphere, it has to correlate to truth and reality. Those are conceptualizations. So these are five realities that every Muslim must believe. That you must believe that there is God. You must believe that he's a reality, that he created uh, the, the, the world, that he was, he precedes time, he's outside of time and space. He created time and space and the heavens and the earth, etc. We believe in angels, that these aren't metaphorical beings, that there are really beings that exist in another dimension, right, beyond our own, but that interact uh, in our dimension by God's command. We also believe in divine scripture, that God communicates with his creation, that he created us for a divine wisdom and purpose, to know him and to serve him. But then he communicates this purpose to us through a succession of prophets. Okay? And that they all essentially came with the same message. Right? When I say essentially, the particulars might differ because that differs with time and place. But their message was essentially the same. God created us, worship him, know him, right? And live in accordance with, with, with morality. Okay? So we believe... Every Muslim has to believe that the Torah was divinely revealed, that the Psalms were divinely revealed, that the Gospel is divinely re revealed, and lastly, the Quran. Where Muslims may differ from their sister faiths is that uh, the accuracy and authenticity can sometimes fall into question. One of the things that the Quran says is that men, we know that religion is great, but sometimes institutions of religion aren't always perfect, right? And that men alter things with their hands, and then so God says, well, we're going to send another revelation to set the record straight, that's not what I said, etc. But with the final revelation, God promises a divine protection from alteration. And we can talk more about that uh, perhaps afterwards. Some of the historical um, evidence of that that's come up recently, that's pretty interesting. Uh, the fourth reality you have to believe in are messengers, that God has sent messengers. We've talked about that already. One thing that's worth noting is that for Muslims, our conception of Jesus, our Christology, is, that, is closer to a Unitarian understanding. That God sent Jesus as the Messiah. He was born of a virgin birth, and he performed these miracles, and he resurrected the dead, and all of these things. Uh, but he came as a prophet, and not as part of 
uh, a, a trinity. He was not God incarnated. He was the Son of God metaphorically. Not God the Son, but the Son of God the way that phrase was used by the Hebrews of the time to refer to a godly person. Um, so we hold him to be a mortal prophet who will return at the end of times. He is the awaited Messiah. So for example, um, if the Orthodox Jews don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, they're still awaiting the Messiah. The Muslims would differ and say, no, he was the Messiah, and those who were present at the time had to follow him in order to be Muslims, right, lowercase m, uh, but that he, he, he was a mortal prophet. Uh, and then the fifth reality is to believe that we are all going to meet our maker and to be held accountable for our actions. That some people can get away with things here in this world, but nobody ultimately gets away with them. But we, 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 we pray for God's mercy on that day. Sorry, the last one, this, this clicker is not participating, is divine decree. One of the things that Muslims believe is that nothing in creation happens without God's willing it and allowing it to be so. Nothing is outside of his power. Good things and bad things happen with God's permission. Because this world was created with for a mixture of good and evil, it's a testing ground of our morality and of our free will. And bad things happening is inseparable from free will, but that doesn't indicate that God is God forbid, out of control, uh, or, or, or the world is outside of his control. So, how many dimensions did we talk about so far? Two. There's a third one coming, but I want to do just a little bit of background here. You keep me on time. So the first is, what is our understanding of humanity? In order to understand this third dimension, you have to understand what is the Islamic conception of what a human being is. What is our nature as human beings? So we have a primary nature. This is our essential nature that we're all born with. Each one of us, if healthy and uh, nurtured properly, we have an innate knowledge of right and wrong. Each of us feels guilt. But this isn't a socially constructed thing, right? Each of us knows inside of ourselves when we do something wrong, and we feel a sense of remorse against it. We also have this inclination towards something that is good and true and beautiful, right? That our primary nature finds the beautiful attractive and that the ugly is repulsive, right? Uh, and the same applies to <coughs> actions, right? There's a reason that in almost all of human history, you had until very recently, you have these stories in which the hero gets the bad guy at the end and everybody now we have the anti-hero, right? Or the bad guy gets away at the end, right? That's a, that's a recent modern phenomenon. But everybody knows that that is resonant with human nature. We want to see those things. We want to see good victorious over evil. So that's our primary nature. But there is also another aspect of ourselves, right? We have a selfish ego as well. So while we incline to that which is good and beautiful and true, we also have a capacity perhaps even I'd use the word a tendency, towards being vengeful and preoccupied with our bodily pleasures. Okay? Now, so we have these two aspects working at the same time. We then have a third, which is God endowed us with reason. That human beings, uh, to borrow Aristotle's term, that we're rational animals. That what distinguishes us from the rest of, of creation is that we have the faculty of reason. And so reason is supposed to help us to listen to our primary nature, and to be in control of our selfish ego, right? So you can even think of a basic encounter with a cheesecake, right? <laughs> the mind tells you, do not touch, don't go there, right? <clears throat> but the appetite is there, okay? Now, if, you're, if your faculty of reason is stronger than your appetite, then you have to say, oh, well, that you've got a lot of discipline. You're disciplined. But those are training grounds for moral discipline. That's why Muslims fast. It's one of the reasons we fast. They're all related. The seven deadly sins, gluttony is one of them for a reason. If you're gluttonous with food, what does that mean with everything else? Nobody ever has just one deadly sin. Right? Even though one is enough to kill you. Right? <laughs> Nobody just has one because, that, because they're interrelated. Now, to get to the third dimension, it's character. It's building this character. So, there's a process that, that is termed in Islamic uh, literature as a purification of the soul. It's a process by which a Muslim struggles and strives, this is the greater jihad that Mike uh, uh, referred to, against the lower desires of their soul to purge these tendencies of the ego that I resist and I fight against my temper and my jealousy and my selfishness. And I work to endow myself with more beautiful virtues. I try to be more generous and more forgiving and more kind and more altruistic. And this process 
is the way in which I purify my soul. Now, part of this also entails an understanding of how we engage the world itself, right? That when it comes to the world, religion obviously has a lot to say. The Muslim understanding would be that we are neither we are in the world, but we're not of the world, right? That we engage the world, uh, as as one of the great sages of Islam said, it's to have the money in your hand, but not in your heart. So you don't live a life of rejection of the world. We don't go and live in monasteries. We're here in Pleasanton, California, working jobs, and we have houses. But we're not here to enjoy this, this place. That's not the very purpose. The place is a bridge. It's a means to an end. This is a spiritual uh, laboratory, if you will, in which we're supposed to exercise and work as a training ground for the afterlife. And so we go between this, the two extremes of indulgence on the one hand, uh, and uh, rejection. So, again, just to recap, Islam views itself as a culmination of previous religious traditions, the final brick, as it were, in God's long uh, uh, successive revelation. Uh, if one surrenders to God, we believe it will bring peace and harmony to the individual and to society as a whole, and it sees itself as a, mo as a middle road of bringing together the great virtues of previous traditions. So, for example, uh, the, uh, the Jewish tradition is known to have a great, rich legal tradition, the rabbinical tr tr tradition. Uh, but Jesus came to remind us, right, that the spirit of the law is greater than the letter of the law as well. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we believe merges these two and brings each in its right place. That there is a, there is a as Hina talked about, we have sharia, we believe in a letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, those six objectives of preservation of life and religion and intellect and family and property and honor, all of those things, that that stays at the center of it all. And so we balance ourselves as surrendered to God with our minds in terms of what we believe, with our bodies in terms of the fact that we pray and we refrain from doing anything that harms another person or stealing, um, and then with our souls because we uh, work on purifying ourselves, purging ourselves of our ego's tendencies and adorning uh, the, the, the virtues uh, of the heart. Um, I thank you for attention. This is sort of just a summary slide. Thank you for your time, and thank you for just being here today. Yeah. You guys ready for the quiz? <laughs> so we share in a, a human father, we also share our forefathers, our American forefathers that founded this country, and made it, this country has been beautiful for a long time, and may it continue to grow in beauty. Amen. Um, there are historical debates of when Muslims and how long Muslims have been a part of this country. And there are sound arguments by historians that Muslims were here prior to Columbus and with Columbus. You might notice in many of the uh, portraits and art depicting that era of history of uh, men wearing turbans, representing Muslims in that era. Um, a part of the, the Revolutionary War was a man named Bampit Muhammad, who contributed to helping this country gain its independence. Uh, also, it, you might find it very interesting to know that in, our, in the Thomas Jefferson Building, in the uh, U.S. Library of Congress, there, there is, on the dome, there's a picture of 12 civilizations or countries uh, that have, that represents who has contributed to this civilization, and one of them listed there is Islam, at the top of that congressional building. You might be surprised to know that in our U.S. Supreme Court, there's an image on the north wall that has great lawgivers, pictures of great lawgivers, and there is an image of a Muslim as well in our own U.S. American Supreme Court. So Muslims have been part and parcel of this country for a very long time. Our next panelist is going to address that connection. Uh, before we proceed to Sarah Kim, I would like to remind everyone that we are going to take a break and come back for question and answers. And at this moment, we're going to share some, pass out some cards.
So no cards for anyone to write your questions. And I invite everyone to be honest and real and raw uh, with these questions so we can leave here in a meaningful manner and in a, be in a beneficial manner. Those are coming around now. So our next panelist, our final panelist, is Sarah Kim. You might notice Mike Kim and Sarah Kim. Yes, they are spouses. Uh, may God bless them. They have been happily married for a couple of decades now with seven children. And they, uh, Sarah Kim manages and operates a ranch called Siena Ranch in Lafayette, which uh, hosts many children that come to, to, to learn gardening or to, to learn how to ride a horse or to learn archery. And she manages that in addition to managing her seven men army at home. She has six boys and one girl, and they're all pretty beautiful. So we invite Sarah to share her story with us, connecting Islam and America and her journey. Please welcome Sarah Kempia. So uh, thank you for the introduction, Nati. Um, we formed this panel about two and a half years ago in response to some of the horrific things that were being said about Muslims in the media. Uh, after a few days of feeling somewhat helpless after the uh, San Bernardino tragedy, we decided we needed to do something, uh, however small it was, to help balance the messages that people are receiving about Muslims and Islam, most of which are just plain false. So it's very important that I start by thanking you all for being here, because we can assemble this panel of speakers all we want in an attempt to share the truths about who we are, but this would have no impact whatsoever if sincere people like yourselves didn't show up to hear us. So I'm honestly uh, humbled and honored to be sitting here before you and uh, sharing my story. I'd like to believe we're all here today because we love our community, we love our country, we love our world, and that we understand that if we seek to know and understand and respect one another, that we're able to actually elevate ourselves and our respective communities and our beloved country to the highest possible levels. The title of my talk today is How Islam Made Me a Better American. But what does that really mean, to be an American? There are likely many definitions for this. However, I'm confident that there are a set of ideals which resonate with most Americans. Compassion, integrity, mutual respect, kindness, generosity, equality. These are all qualities which I think good human beings, good Americans, strive to embody. And what I would like to talk specifically today about is a topic I can address with what I hope is a sincere and passionate heart, and that's the topic of racism. Growing up, I was very close to my paternal grandparents. I would spend summers in North Carolina with them, and since I was an early riser like my grandfather, we would enjoy a daily 7 a.m. breakfast at a restaurant nestled at the bottom of the mountain where he lived. I was proclaimed his favorite granddaughter, partially because I was named after his eldest daughter, Sarah Jo, who had passed away in a tragic car accident just a year before I was born. And apparently I looked like Sarah Jo as well, so his affinity towards me was clear and understandable to all. And in return, I deeply adored him. He was a generous man who showered love and affection on all of us grandchildren. The one thing I remember not knowing how to love about him, however, was his deep-seated racism and hatred for people of color. He openly insulted and disrespected black people. He frequently used the N-word. I remember being really uncomfortable with his attitude and actions towards blacks. So naturally, I exonerated myself from being racist. In hindsight, however, I realized that the post-civil rights era in the South was still rife with unspoken racism. Though there were African Americans in town and in school, we had very little to do with one another. I didn't have any black friends. I didn't live near black people. I didn't sit near black people in class or at lunch. Basically, there was minimal to no interaction between them and us. Separate but equal may have been banished by law, but it was alive and well in everyday actions, even in mine. And on my mind, however, I was all-American as apple pie. A blonde-haired, blue-eyed high school cheerleader, my European ancestors landed on American shores in the early days of settlement, 
My mother is part Native American. I lived in southern suburbia and was the daughter of a self-made businessman, attending some of the best public schools in the area, along with church on Sundays, and I had my mind set squarely on attending the service academy after graduation. Who could possibly be more American than me? In 1996, I had completed a couple of years at the U.S. Naval Academy before deciding military life was not for me. I transferred to the University of Maryland to get my degree in civil engineering, married my husband Mike, and had our first son then. Mike was still in the Navy and stationed in Japan, and I stayed in the States to finish my degree. And it was at this time that I was introduced to Islam. Since my talk is not about my conversion story, I won't go into too much detail about how I chose to enter into this religion. But I do want to share with you how being Muslim completely altered my understanding of race. Before I do that, however, I think this would be an appropriate time to share a few of the Islamic teachings regarding race, which come to us via the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or via sayings from our, or verses taken from our holy book, the Quran, which we believe to be the direct word of God. And as I share these with you, please keep in mind the opening line of the preamble of the direct Declaration of Independence, the document which formed the foundation of our, of our nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. In Islam, we are taught that righteousness is the only quality that makes someone virtuous in the sight of God, not race, or skin color, or lineage, or country. In his last and final public sermon to the Muslims over 1,400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, very clearly addressed this topic of racism when he said, O people, your Lord is one, and your father Adam is one. There is no favoritism of an Arab over a foreigner, nor a foreigner over an Arab, neither redskin over blackskin, or blackskin over redskin, except through righteousness. We were also taught by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that God created Adam from handfuls of clay and dirt, collected from the different areas of the earth. So just as the dirt of the earth is different colors, we have black soil, white sands, red clay, the children of Adam come in different colors as well. Finally, he taught us that there is no good in red skin or black skin, but that our value lies only in our righteousness and in our closeness to God. So these are just some of the teachings of Islam that slowly began to permeate my life and to help me develop a deeper understanding of the problems with racism. However, there was one crucial time in my life that these teachings really took hold and taught me the true essence of what it meant to be an American. My father, at the age of 50, was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor and given, brain tumor and given two months to live. I wanted to take my young son, Ben, back home with me to South Carolina so I could take care of my father in his final days. He readily agreed to have me come home, but firmly warned me against trying to convert him to my new religion. I had become Muslim only three months prior. I assured him I would do no such thing, and I headed to South Carolina. Interestingly enough, in a very short period of time, after quietly observing me in my worship and noting my newfound mindfulness that I had brought to my day-to-day -day life, my father began questioning me about my new faith. Facing death, he was forced to think about his own mortality, so he started seeking answers to the questions of what might be coming after death and what had been the real purpose of life. I tried my best to answer his questions, but my own limited knowledge of my new religion could not satiate his deep curiosity. He peppered me with questions, and I literally ran out of answers. In desperation to provide him with what he was looking for, I searched for a local Muslim community where I might be able to take him so he could speak to someone, anyone, who could give him the answers that I couldn't provide. I searched in the phone book, I asked around, nothing. I could find no Muslims anywhere close to us. I was desperate. For days and nights I prayed to God. Though I didn't know everything about Islam, I did know one of the irrefutable tenets of the religion is that one condition of prayer is that you have to recognize and submit 
to the knowledge that only God has the power to answer your prayer. And answer it, he did. One morning, my father stumbled across an ad in a local paper announcing the grand opening of an Islamic center in the next town. He eagerly showed it to me, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was truly a miracle. God had sent us some Muslims. <laughs> the very next Saturday, we drove to Rockville, South Carolina, to meet these Muslims in the hopes that they could help my father settle the affairs of his soul. To my surprise, and honestly, to my disappointment, we saw that the entire group was comprised of African Americans. Not one other white person was in the room. My heart sank, certain that this was a mistake. Deep down, I knew there was no way my father could be guided to a new belief system through a group of African Americans. It just wasn't possible. He had been conditioned his whole life to spurn them. But another fact we are taught in Islam, God is greater. What you often hear as Allahu Akbar. God is greater than all the limitations that we place upon ourselves and the limitations we place upon others. For in fact, when my father emerged from that center, he was a man deeply moved by all those whom he had met. He was a man who received the answers to the questions that had remained unanswered for so long, and he was now a man of the Muslim faith. God is truly greater than anything we can imagine. Through the words and the actions and the sincerity of those whom he had been groomed to hate, he had found acceptance, love, and a faith that he would embrace and practice as a means of drawing closer to his Creator until his death almost one year later. May God have mercy on him. This is something Muslims say about those who have passed, similar to when people say, God rest his soul, or may he rest in peace. The black Muslim community in South Carolina took very good care of my dad and me. They would invite us to their homes every Friday after congregational prayers. My father would be with the men and I would hang out with the women and children. The men became an unwavering web of support for my father, teaching him, guiding him, and helping him come to terms with his impending death. While I was comforted by and thrilled with the peace that my father had finally found, this was actually a momentous turning point for me as well. For the first time in my life, I had black friends, but they were more than friends to me. They were my sisters. We would pray together, sing together, eat together, and laugh together. It was a beautiful and memorable time in my life. It was a Friday in February, nearly one year after my dad's conversion to Islam, when he returned to his Lord. At the time of his passing, my two-year-old son Ben, an African-American brother named Abdullah, and I were all sitting at his bedside. By the way, Muslim women often refer to Muslim men as brothers, and the men often return, refer to the women as sisters out of respect. Anyway, this brother had come to visit my father so that he could read from the Holy Quran in his presence. Muslims believe that the recitation of the Quranic words in Arabic brings solace to the heart, and that the specific reading of the chapter Yasin helps ease the soul's passing from this world to the next. It was through the lips of this black man that these verses aided my father's soul. It was the brothers from this community who came to pick up his body. It was they who, who shrouded him and who prepared him for his burial. They arranged for the funeral, transported his coffin into the cemetery, lowered his body into the ground, and prayed over him in accordance with the Islamic rituals of burial. There were rows and rows of black men praying for my father's soul. If only my grandfather had been there to witness that tremendous and powerfully ironic scene. So that was the starting point from which all of my unrealized racism began to melt away. It was at this point that I became truly Muslim and truly American. I understood unequivocally the power of humanity without preconceived notions or discriminatory underpinnings. And upon moving back to California, I have continued to be blessed with the most amazing friends and community members from all backgrounds, races, and religions. It is on this premise of mutual respect for all of God's creation that I have found a true kinship with races, with all races and all people. I have been taught that to treat everyone with dignity and respect is an actual act of worship. Because of our faith, my life and my husband's life and my children's lives have been elevated. 
And I hope and I pray that we will always be positive contributors to the greater society in which we live. I can surely say with immense gratitude and humility that I am a better human being and a better American for it. It is my sincerest wish that my children, along with all of the children of our Muslim communities, will lead future generations of Americans based on the premise of God's command to get to know one another in peace and respect and to create a life that uplifts all that is good and suppresses all that is evil. Thank you for taking the time to get to know us and for honoring me by listening to my story. I sincerely pray that this afternoon is just the beginning of a wonderful new friendship. God willing. Thank you, Sarah. I want to acknowledge that it's 12 o'clock and we have it till 12.30. How are you guys feeling? How are you guys doing? Strong. You guys all right? You guys good? Let, 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 let's, let's stand up and just stretch for a moment before we continue. Let's, let's stand up. And if we can collect the questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice mm -hmm. You guys want me to lead you in a stretch? Mm -hmm. CrossFit style? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> We're coming around to collect the questions, or you can bring it up. We truly want to honor your questions and honor your time, and so we want to conclude by 12.30, so we can have lunch as well. So we're going to take a couple minute stretch break right now and then and then jump into the questions just to make sure we have time to answer them. Yes. 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 For Mexicans. Jews not allowed. Irish need not apply. Caution, beware of natives. Japs keep moving. This is a white man's neighbor. <laughs> Today it's the turn Muslims are taking that turn. My wife writes, and she has, on, she has written on her card, I'm writing to humanize the demonized. Humanize the demonized. Right? And so today, it's the Muslims' turn to, to go through this moment of difficulty in our American journey. When they, when they tell my wife, Go home. Where should I go to? Los Angeles? <laughs> go home. Where should I go to? Chicago? I don't consider any other place home. My parents emigrated here in the 60s. Her parents emigrated here a couple centuries ago. Dr. Esad is from Michigan. Go home. Where should I go? To Ann Arbor? <laughs> a documentary just came out. You might be interested in watching it. It's called Redneck Muslim. Redneck Muslim. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I'm re for real. You might want to watch it. It's a uh, it's a uh, um, um, an American man who who found his journey to God uh, through Islam and embraced Islam, and uh, and and this is about his life and his journey. Um, so this is this is our this is our home, and and may we all contribute. To making it a beautiful and comfortable home for all of our neighbors. Amen. Amen. So we want to jump into the questions and answers because we only have about 26 minutes. All right, so Mike, please go ahead. Okay, so the question I got was, um, does it say in the Quran that Muslims are to, to uh, their task is to take over the world? Um, no, it doesn't. And in fact, it's quite the opposite because one of the reasons why I was attracted to Islam was, was that it made it very clear that only God knew the fate of another soul, no matter what they called themselves, what religion they subscribed to. But we do not know the end state of another human being's soul. And it was, it was very clear that whether you call yourself a Christian, a Jew, or a Muslim, or anything else, that, that God would decide where you end up. So that, in and of itself, told me that that the, the world will be mixed with all different sorts of people, if you will, right, to the very end. The Islam is not going to take over the world, if you will. 
other thing is what uh, Mahdi mentioned that that there were 124,000 prophets sent throughout uh, the, the existence of humanity. So we see we find vestiges and connection points, whether it's Native American traditions or Buddhist traditions, that are that are very reminiscent of our teachings. So clearly, it seems to me that they were guided by you know some form of prophet. So who am I? Who are we to say that they're illegitimate or we know better than they? The reality is, you know, God, God made it amply clear in the Quran that, that we live in a world with, with, with very backgrounds, religions, and skin tones, and etc., etc. That's what's spoken about today. So it, it's, it's, an, it's divinely impossible, in my view, that Islam will take over the world. The question is how to interact with Muslims in the right way to say welcome. Um, something I've been noticing recently is people are just being really friendly and um, smiling, saying hello when you pass them, uh, maybe opening the door when you go into the grocery store. It's just not looking at them as different where you can't interact. You know, we're just normal people. Um, like you, it just like you know, especially for us who wear a headscarf. I think it is a barrier. People see it as a barrier, and it's meant to be a barrier to a certain to a certain extent. But more about men and women like interacting um, in a. Um, so um, so I think the way to uh, interact and to make Muslims feel welcome is just to treat us like you would anyone else and be friendly. Um, and you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Just like, oh, I noticed you're wearing that. Like, you know, or or sometimes people are like, oh, what a beautiful scarf you have. And I know they probably the scarf isn't anything special. It's just their way of trying to reach out. But it means a lot. It actually makes a difference. Um, and I personally really appreciate that. Um, I'll just tag on to Sarah's answer because somebody asked the question here about within the workplace between. Muslims and non-Muslims, non men and women, when they interact, um, what's the best, what are the guidelines um, in social and non-business situations, among the questions. So this often comes up with, you know, just like any other community, you're going to find the whole spectrum, even amongst Muslims, of levels of practice, levels of adherence to the different rules of Sharia. Um, you may, uh, a man may put his hand out to shake the hand of a Muslim woman and she'll take his hand and shake it, no problem. Another Muslim woman may say, I'm sorry, I, I don't shake hands with men. And so just to understand that people have their limits, if you want to just play it safe, between the genders, it is universally accepted amongst Muslims that the way we greet each other is we put our hand on our heart and we just like nod and greet each, greet each other. So I know when I go to um, interfaith gatherings, I like to let the organizers give a general announcement that I don't I personally don't feel comfortable um, shaking hands or hugging men. And so it, it's really nice when people understand that from the get-go. We don't have those um, awkward situations. There's a really cute video that just went viral yesterday I saw where Prince Harry <laughs> went to a, a charity event with his wife. And um, the, his, his mother-in-law greeted the Muslim woman who's dressed from head to toe, you know, according to Sharia, fully covered. And the Muslim woman greets his mother-in-law by kissing her three times. And, no, she, the, sorry. The Muslim woman greets the mother-in-law by kissing her three times. And then Prince Harry comes in, and he's joking around, but he does the three kisses, but he did air kisses, like the virtual kisses, like just to make it clear, I'm not going to touch you, but I also want to do the, you know, the greeting. It was so cute. And all the Muslims are sharing it, because we're like, how many of us have experienced this? We know that awkward moment. It was really nice to know that he did recognize his limits, and he didn't he didn't try to touch the Muslim woman, but at the same time he greeted her in a very friendly manner. That's all anybody wants is people to be friendly and accepting. Um, a couple of quick questions. Uh, does the Muslim culture believe if someone wears the hijab if they're not Muslim? Do Muslims consider that disrespectful? No, not at all. The headscarf is. In many different cultures, the Russian culture, it's in uh, the Jewish culture, it's in um, many traditional cultures, and even you know, when I first started wearing the headscarf, I, I decided to wear it uh, when my husband actually wasn't that comfortable with the idea of me putting on the headscarf. But yeah, you know, 
stepped aside and let me do my thing. But one thing he said was, can you wear your headscarf like the way Audrey Hepburn used to wear it? And then Grace <laughs> Kelly used to wear it. <laughs> so, <laughs> headscarves have been around. Um, okay, so a couple of uh, questions for teachers, from teachers. As a as an upper elementary teacher with many Muslim children in my classroom, how can I best honor, include, and celebrate them? How can I help them to feel safe and proud of their beliefs? I'm a middle school teacher here in Pleasanton. How can I best support Muslim students, especially during Ramadan? And then have your children experienced rejection or negative experiences in local schools? So teachers can definitely set the tone and they can make or break uh, the experience in public schools for students. My three sons happened to be homeschooled up until eighth grade, and the two of them did go to local public schools here in San Ramon. My middle son went to a private school in Southern California. But we, it's been very heartwarming to see how much teachers do go out of their way to try and make their students of different backgrounds feel welcome. Um, one of the predicaments that we had when they were starting school was about prayer in, in the local public school. Like, how were they going to take care of their prayer? And where would they go to do that? And they had different teachers say that you're welcome to come into my classroom. You can use my classroom to do your afternoon prayer. Um, the principal offered his office to my son and said, you can come and take care of your prayer here. And then later was sensitive enough to say, you know, actually, I'm not going to have you do your prayer in my office because I don't want people thinking you got into trouble every time you come out, so let me give you the conference room. Um, one thing that came up was in ninth grade, in the PE class, uh, there's a unit apparently that some PE teachers teach in ninth grade in California, which is a dance unit. And so, you know, my son was taking this PE class thinking he was just going to be playing sports, and then all of a sudden he was told, okay, you're going to learn the foxtrot and the tango and the waltz, and you have to learn how to ask a girl how to dance, and you have to have a, a <laughs> dance partner, and all of a sudden there was this quandary, like, how, how does he deal with this? And so, because um, Muslim men and women don't have physical contact with one another before marriage, unless they're related to one another. And so he let his PE teacher know that he's more than willing to learn about dance, but it's not something he's going to be doing with, with a woman. He's not going to be, you know, touching in girls or dancing with them. So the teacher was very considerate. He said, okay. And the teacher reached out to me and said, you know, we could have Sean go and just run laps at that time, or I can have him switch over to another PE class where they're doing something else like volleyball. But he said it would be a real shame for the students to miss out on an opportunity to learn about another religion and another culture. So is there any form of dance from your religious tradition that Chan could come and maybe teach the kids about? And that would make up for the dance unit for him. And it was really great. He ended up teaching them about a Sufi dance. And uh, they formed a circle. And he taught them the history behind it and the purpose behind it. And the kids were kind of intrigued. But And then his teacher later told him that he had different Muslim students over the years who he knew what um, you know, what the cultural sensitivity needed to be, thanks to the, his experience with Sean. So it was nice to know that he was that open-minded. So as far as making students feel welcome, um, just asking them, is there anything you need? In Ramadan, students might be tired, they might be a little, you know, um, thirsty, uh, more than hungry in classrooms, and there's nothing you can do to appease that, but just understanding if students are feeling a little tired in your classroom, especially near the end of the day, um, asking them, are you fasting? And uh, um, just letting, basically all Muslim kids want, and this is what I remember from my experience as well, is you just want to know that people don't think you're weird. And they, you know, you're not feeling apologetic for, for, for your faith. And one of the reasons my husband and I chose to homeschool our kids is because we wanted them to have that confidence in their religion and to see it as the norm before they felt they had to go out and constantly explain why they were different. And um, yeah. but thank you for asking those questions because that shows a high level of sensitivity. Okay. So lots of questions. I'm going to work to be brief because you, you guys might have more questions coming up. So it'll be sort of like speed 
dating with your questions. <laughs> so uh, it'll probably be like a minute each. Each of these that I that I have here, I have about seven. They're great questions. Each of which great questions. Each of which I can answer in fifteen minutes, probably. But I'm I'm going to try to be brief, simply to give you an answer, and hopefully maybe in our conversations afterwards, um, if, if something was left uh, unsaid, we can elaborate. So without further ado. Um, and I refer to the mind and the soul. What is the difference? Some of these have like two or three questions, so I'm going to try to go through each other. The, the difference between the mind and the soul is sort of, you know, if you think about your heart, heart is also a synonym for soul in Islamic literature. So, you, you know, you, can, you think with your heart, you conceive, you reason, um, but there's an, a type of intuition with the heart which is different than that of the mind. Um, and so when we talk about our heart, you know, doing, making a decision with your heart and not your mind, or your mind and not your heart, yeah, it would be something... Um, similar to that, they both are aspects of our cognition, right? We all, we have awareness, we have cognition, um, our minds, our souls all play a role into that. Our sensory experience, even our bodies, play a role into our, our cognitive experience. Next question. History shows change. Abraham to Jesus to Muhammad. Peace be upon all of them. How or why then be so sure that nothing will evolve and be added? Wonderful question. Um, there is no reason to, to know that or to believe that unless it's stated. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that God sends a succession of uh, uh, messengers and prophets, but I'm the seal of prophethood. With me, the door closes and it's completed. That's why he uses the final brick. It's not a two-thirds finished building and he's one more brick. He actually says, I'm the final brick and God's message is complete. Um, one other aspect of that is we believe that if you look at these statements of previous prophets, they're always sent to their people. So Moses says he wasn't really sent to uh, the Egyptians, he sent to the Jews, and he has to get them out of Egypt. Uh, even Jesus has phrases, and I, I realize there's, there's uh, debates even amongst Christian theologians, but he says, I was sent to the Jew, not to the Gentile, in certain parts. So what we believe as Muslims is that the Prophet Muhammad says, I was sent to all of humanity. My message is a universal message and can be accepted and therefore adopted in all different times, places, cultures, and history has, has, has borne that out as well. Um, it's a great question. We believe that it was explicitly stated, sorry, in the Quran, God says so in the Quran very explicitly that this is the end of my message to humanity, it's completed, and, uh, yeah. Um, would you clarify for any of the major differences between Sunni and Shia Muslims? Uh, this is a great question. There are entire books written on this. Uh, very briefly, very briefly, um, there aren't uh, there aren't uh, that many uh, differences that you could really observe from the outside. They have the same holy book. They have the same five pillars that we talked about. Uh, they have basic understandings and frameworks. It's probably a corollary to sort of a Protestant Catholic difference of opinion, um, where. Uh, you had these theological debates that started early on, and they just sort of solidified into these two camps. That had to do with a political succession initially. That where is um, how is the community best led? Is it something inherited that it has to be the grandson of the prophet, or is you know is it something inherited as a bloodline, or is it something that the community um, takes on? And that's that those that debate became a theological position, um, and then it sort of. Uh, manifested from there. Uh, but in essence, they have always, if, if you're wondering, the same way Protestants and Catholics aren't always in conflict, right? Until the recent events in Iraq, right? Uh, Sunnis and Shia have been living, I mean, they live side by side. It's, you know, it's, it doesn't always lead to conflict. Uh, this is, is Islamic literature literal or metaphorical, for example, creation versus evolution? This is like a 10 volume, like, page. <laughs> <laughs> what are the questions? No, what are the questions? These are great questions. So I would say it's both. There are clearly passages um, that are literal. When God says, there is only one God, and you will be resurrected on the day of judgment, and do not kill an innocent soul. Now, those are, You don't say that's metaphorical. I think God means I can kill, but he just means like I can't kill. Right? I mean, it's those are literal, right? But then there are clearly verses in the Quran that are metaphorical. So how do we know the difference between the two? Those, that's for the, the scholars of exegesis. That's a fancy sort of uh, discipline in which they study the language and the context and what was meant here. Um, we believe, obviously, that when, when things are said about God, um, there are some things that are clear,
conceptual positions, they're theological statements, but others are metaphors because we can't understand the infinite. It's ineffable. Like we, we can't, you know, it's interesting, one of, one of the most interesting verses in the Quran, God says, there is nothing similar to, there's nothing like unto God, yet he is the all-hearing and all-seeing. He just says, there's nothing like him, but then he says, yet he's all, he gives us Things that we, we know what sight is and we know what hearing is, but we know his seeing isn't by light rays coming to a retina and being processed, right? Like, sight is different from him, hearing is different from him, but we have some type of, we have a metaphorical understanding of, of what divine sight and hearing might be and divine knowledge because we have some understanding of what that is on a human level. So, um, there are, there, there's both creation and evolution. <laughs> I really want to get into this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Creation and evolution. One of the things that's very clear in the Quran is that we believe that God created us. That He created the world. Um, ex nihilo is, 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 is a term theologians. Out of nothing, right? The Big Bang, right, is this point that scientists um, uh, surmised was a you know infinite density, infinite temperature, no breadth, width, or depth. Out of nothing, God created the whole universe. God does not detail. It's very interesting. God does not detail how he created human beings. Um, there are statements that sort of guide our understandings, but God, there is a, there's, an, a, there's a debate amongst Muslim theologians about um, how to understand these verses, uh, but no Muslim would ever accept sort of randomness, unguided randomness being how the world evolved. Like all this design. God says he's the creator, meaning brings everything out of nothing, but he also says he's the fashioner, right? He designs us. He guides these things. He talks about his forming us in our mother's wombs and guiding us. And if we study even basic embryology, right, uh, it's, a, it's incredible that the DNA code is so complex, right, um, it's so precise, uh, the, ability, the, the, the margin of error that, 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 it, that, it, that it permits in order to make a viable fetus is just so, it, it's unfathomably low, right? So we believe there's a designer, you know. If, 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 um, so these things are very, um, that, you know, they're, they're, they're areas that we don't know how God created us. In fact, there's a verse in the Quran, uh, and I said I was going to be brief, here I go. There's a verse in the Quran that says, God says to us, you didn't see how I created you. You didn't see how I created the heavens and the earth, and you didn't witness your own creation. So there's obviously some mystery to exactly how, who knows, right? We know that God could create everything in an instant, but he says he created the world in seven days. Like, well, what does that even mean? Are those literal days? Are those eons or eras? That's it, sorry, six days, right? Uh, are those eras or eons? Or what is that? Those are, those are all, you know, which God created us. That's what we know. Um, so there's, I think there's, 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 uh, that's the, the, the guidelines, I think, that the, that the Quran gives us. Um... I read that no one can really understand the Quran in Arabic. How do you deal with that? Um, in order to be to actually interpret the Quran accurately, you have to go to its original Arabic. That's that's true. If you want to understand it, if a translation is literally someone else's interpretation, so to make an uh, to make an assessment of what the Quran says from a translation, you are accepting someone else's interpretation. Scholars of the Quran uh, read it in the original Arabic. Yes, correct. Love. My brother-in-law said that the Quran does not have the word love in it. Perhaps he didn't read it. <laughs> Google says otherwise. Uh, Google's right on this time. <laughs> <laughs> this is because the Quran is about your conduct. No, this is a great question. Is this because the Quran is about conduct? No, the Quran has very little of it dedicated. Probably less than 10% is dedicated to conduct. Right? Pick a page of the Quran and read it. It's more ethical, moral. It's reminders of the day of judgment. There's spiritual injunctions, right? It's about every verse will end with God. You know, God loves those who are patient. God does not love the the the, the, uh, the you know the the oppressor. You know, etc. They're guidance about virtues and ethics. That's I would say. Um, there there are many different themes to the Quran, but. Uh, definitely, there's love in the Quran, uh, love for God and love for other people, uh, it's, etc. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know where that came from, that misunderstanding. Pork. All days there was no refrigeration. Eat anything. An unclean animal, Muslims don't eat. Um, what science is there that says it's unclean in today's world? Sharia and slaughter. Okay, so it's very important to understand that while Muslims do believe 
as Mike alluded to, that science will simply affirm and confirm what we believe from God. It's those are the reasons that we do it, right? So it's not, it's very important to understand, I mean, even though trichinosis still has something like 10,000 cases a year still happen, etc. That, that's not the point. Um, what we would say is, God has forbidden intoxicants for us. It would be forbidden for me to take a sip, even if I know that I won't be intoxicated from it, right? God's injunction, he will tell us his wisdom and reasoning behind it. But we can't say, I know I'm like a, I'm a five-beer guy before I really get tipsy. <laughs> <laughs> it's allowed for me to have three. That, that, that wouldn't be valid reasoning. God gives this because these are guidelines for us to live by. And as time goes on, yes, the more we learn about science and the more things come out, we're, we're, we get confirmation, but that's not why we do it. You know, it's, like, it's one of those things where... Um, they, 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 they make, it, they make your, your faith firmer in your heart when you realize that's not why you did it. You trust God to begin with. He created us. He knows us. There's something He knows. And it also includes the, the fallacy that everything is reducible to material science to begin with, which we don't know. Maybe there's a spiritual impact of eating pork. But we're much more than just, you know, as Yoda said, right? luminous beings are we, not this crude body. Right. You guys all remember that scene? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, I'm sorry, I'm really trying to be brief. We live in a profoundly racist country. How do you speak to curbing this through your religion? Um, wonderful question. What I would say is, there's a, a tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he says, um, help your brother, whether he's the oppressor or the oppressed. And so they said to him, they said, oh, messenger of God, we know how to help him if he's oppressed. But how do we help him if he's the oppressor? And they said, we'll stop him from his own oppression. What's amazing about this is that the Prophet Muhammad is reminding us that even your brother, when he's an oppressor, is still your brother. And there has to be a love and a mercy as a reason for engagement. One of the worst things you can do is demonize a racist person. I mean, Sarah's story, and I can't, like, I've heard it probably 15 times, and I still have to control my emotions, it's very powerful that people can be redeemed, you know? And to demonize others as sort of unredeemable is something antithetical to the teachings of, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, what's amazing is some of, his, there was some of his enemies who fought him for 20 years, and at the end he won them over and, 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 and they became Muslim. And he didn't say, you know, he, there's no good in him. He said, give him time, you know? Maybe he'll come around. And he preached and he taught, and he preached and he taught. But you have to see a brother in humanity on the other side. Uh, somebody whose ego is overpowering them, someone whose ignorance, this is all comes from ignorance. The Prophet Muhammad called racism a type of ignorance that a person has, but it can be taken out with exposure, with education, with knowledge, with love, with kindness, with meeting someone, right? Um, and fortunately, you know, those stories are abound. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Stereotypically, Islam is seen as a conservative religion. Do you see the religion as becoming, becoming more progressive as the U.S. becomes more liberal? Um, wonderful question. Very tough question again. Um, I would say that Islam has certain uh, core principles that are unchangeable um, and that are uh, universal. So, for example, one thing we would say is... Um, their, you know, the, the, the core teachings that we've covered now, they're unchangeable. Um, there are things that will change with time and culture and place. Islam is a practice, even today in China, right, the way it's in sub-Saharan Africa and the way it's practiced, you know, so there's cultural adjustment in the sort of secondary, tertiary aspects, the, the, the particulars. But the core teachings of Islam, uh, we believe, are, are universal. They, they're applicable to all times and places. Why? Because they speak to our soul. And the human soul doesn't change. We might have skyscrapers and iPhones, but the human soul hasn't changed. We're facing the same problems, right? Who doesn't have a temper problem? Who hasn't dealt with jealousy at some point? Who hasn't, right? If, when we figure that out with technology, sure, then you might be able to do that. Right? But if you're speaking to the human ills and the needs of the human soul to find God, those, those, those changings are, uh, are universal. Um, however, what I will say is, uh, this is, I think, a challenge of all religion, right? Which is, how do you cope with, um, I, I'm going to say it, uh, how do you cope with 
perhaps almost an oppressively totalitarian understanding of pluralism that forces you to be different in order to, 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 to be accepted. So I think it's a challenge on both ends. As America becomes more liberal and more progressive, can it tolerate people who don't follow along in all spheres of liberal progressive, progressivism? That's, that's, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please so I, I feel a bit more strongly about this than, than, than what as I said, which is Please. take for example the concept of, of judgment day, one of the, the beliefs that we have to as Muslims have. So what does that mean? So you see, as a human being, if we believe in judgment day, it necessarily means that we will be judged by God for our actions and our deeds here on earth. Therefore, we, would, we, we then live a consequential life that has eternal consequences, right? That elevates our humanity here on earth. Now, what I say, how I treat another human being, is it will have eternal consequences. It elevates our humanity, right? If absent religion, absent that concept of, of judgment day, it then introduces a, a world system by, which is very relativistic. So therefore, we have this introduction of all manner of isms, nihilism, atheism, socialism, all these isms, okay, you know, whatever the fashionable ism is of the epoch, of the era, right? And there lies the danger of it. In, in, in something as simple as this, like I, I'll just give you one quick real-world example. As I said, I was in the Navy. From the time I entered the Naval Academy to the time I got in the Navy, I watched no TV. None. Okay. When I left, when I entered the Naval Academy, stuff I watched was Leave it to Beaver, it is enough. I mean, the sexiest it got was, was Dukes of Hazard, right? I come back, 11 years later, turn on TV, I was shocked at what I saw. I was shocked. I was like, can they say that? Can they show that? So, so what happened was our society, so we don't, we don't believe that through the passage of time, things get better in our, in our religion. We don't believe that. We think that actually there's a, there's a significant deterioration. That's just one small example of the, of the loss of ethics and morality. I mean, the only thing I've seen today in the public square is prayer. But anything else goes. Anything goes in the public square except except worship. So I do feel quite strongly about that. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to try to briefly... Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually 12.30, so I think I'm going to answer just one last question. Yeah, I'm going to answer this question because I think it's... Do we have permission to go like another five minutes yeah, to answer sure, this question? Sure. Sure. All right, let's, okay. let's close in five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll just do this one. So this, is a, this question is, what is the view of Islam on the LGBT community? Um, so this is a question I think that I, I have to answer in a, in a few parts. So the first is the way the question is phrased um, is pretty ambiguous. What's the view on the community? Um, it's interesting, Islam uh, tends to look at things on multiple dimensions, right? So there's the, there's the actual act itself, right? Um, and then there are the people who commit any such act. Um, and then there's looking at it sort of morally, ethically, philosophically, what does that mean? Um, and then there's the social dimension of that act, right? Um, to be clear, and I don't think anyone will find this as a surprise, Abrahamic morality condemns certain sexual act outside of the marriage of a man and a woman, right? That's, that's the, no big reveal there. That's Abrahamic morality um, as far back as, as, as things go. However, I think that Islam makes a distinction between the act and between a person who commits the act. Um, Islam wouldn't see someone as defined by that sin. So we wouldn't call uh, a person... Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think our language today, people frame their entire identity perhaps by something. Muslims wouldn't see that. That would be a person. Their essence is that they are a soul that God created. Um, and we all fall into sin of different types. And if somebody's struggling with this sin or obeying that command, there's people who um, have an affinity to alcohol or gambling. And they deal with those addictions and those are challenging. Um, and so there's no judgment that God hates you because you are X or you do X. The presumption is that we all have our tendencies that we're struggling against. Nobody's surprised or shocked when someone um, is, is struggling with that. So, although we would condemn an act, people themselves are to be respected as people who are struggling uh, with controlling whatever. And this applies to any desire. I mean, Muslims don't see this as unique or different than someone who, you know, falls outside of God's commands on adultery and whatever, whatever it might be. It's all the same. It's disobeying God. It doesn't make someone... Uh, whereas certain 
you know, in America we have in Florida somewhere, right? People who hold up signs, God hates you, God, you know, that God created you in a way that he hates you. We believe that God created us all with various struggles, um, and that what we're supposed to do is, 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 uh, is uh, fight those fights to the best that we can and live as ethically as possible. Now, what Islam would never permit for any sin is to then abuse or beat people up or harm people based on uh, on these things. Now, we all know people have had same-sex uh, attraction for centuries. It's not that there's nothing new. This wasn't didn't start in like the you know the, the 50s and 60s. Um, and so the question is, how did Muslim societies treat this in the past? Sexuality was generally a very private thing. It was very close to don't ask, don't tell. If people did things, you just it remained private, and they that was seen as their struggle with God, and they would work it out. With, with God. They would repent, or they would struggle, or they would do whatever they did. And that's the same for, like I said, anyone who was a, a womanizer. Like, that's a sexual, uh, 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 you know, indecency that a person, and if they do that, they need to repent. And they, and, but no, in no way would we say in order to love or help that person that we have to affirm what they do as being morally or, or, or Islamically upright. So, what, what we would say is that we would help that person through things uh, without uh, condoning the act itself, because there are strict guidelines on what types of um, sexual acts are, are permitted. It has to even be under marriage. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot more that can be said on that. But even socially, we have to talk about the, about the impact of making sexuality, which is something that was ve something very much kept in the private uh, arena in, 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 in all societies. I don't think this was something... You know, we forget what America was like. I mean, I, I really thank Mike for that reminder. I mean, like, leave it to Beaver to... I remember... Uh, one, one of my friends told me that um, their, his mother was telling him about when Elvis first shook his hips on, on, on his knee. And we were like, oh my God, how obscene was that? So, right? He's like Saint Elvis right now. Right? Like, you know, really. I mean, uh, so, so, so it's amazing to see how sexuality went from these things. It's not like people deal with it. It's not there aren't adulterers before, people with sexual uh, uh, indecencies and people with all types of, right? But it was kept private, and the public space it was respected. Something where children could be around, that people's uh, sensitivities could be respected. So what I would say is that Muslims would, would although would condemn the act, would really um, you know, make sure that room was there for people to repent, to grow within the Muslim community. Um, and would also uh, uh, argue that there has, in order for a healthy conversation about this to really happen, there also has to be room for Muslim belief to exist. And sometimes it's that doesn't happen either. That Muslims have to be comfortable enough to say, our, our religion condemns this act. It has to be a, a type of tolerance as well. And I'll stop there, because this is a can of worms. <laughs> Can we just get a round of applause for you? That speed dating was nice. Um, if you want, if you want to access that, that text again, it's called "Being Muslim: A Practical Guide." Uh, does MCC have copies for sale? Or? Yeah, I'll put them up. Okay, MCC, the Muslim Community Center of East Bay, they have a website. Um, we invite you to visit and to uh, put your email address. It's a pretty active community center with many frequent events. MCCEastBay.org. MCCEastBay.org. We'd like to, I'd like to personally thank you again. I've been here my whole life. I'm almost 40 years old. Uh, this past year or two years has been uh, maybe the most frightening years of my life in America. My wife uh, and my daughter, my daughter chose this. Um, actually, my daughter and Dr. Esad's daughter, uh, they made a deal. They're like, you know what? We're going to put the hijab on together so we can help each other. And I didn't know that. <laughs> but uh, she chose to wear it, and, and I'm scared for her. So thank you for coming out today and, re and reminding me that there are, uh, there is still beauty, and there are beautiful people, and there is hope, and there's optimism. And, and uh, our job is to just bring light to darkness, bring virtue to vice, bring knowledge to ignorance, bring peace to conflict, bring beauty to ugliness. And that's what you guys have done today. 
You guys have truly done that. So, you guys, uh, the, the lunch is well deserved. <laughs> I'm just going to conclude um, uh, with a prayer. Feel free to participate as you deem fit. Uh, thank you for giving us the extra nine minutes beyond the, the program. In the name of God, the source of mercy, the giver of mercy, all praises due to you, Lord of the worlds, the source of mercy, the giver of mercy. Master of the day of judgment, it is you we worship, and it is you we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those who have earned your favor, not those who have earned your anger or who have went astray. Amen. We, we turn to, we ask you, God, to accept this gathering and to accept all of our hearts and to gather us all in your heaven. Amen. We ask you to give us sincerity in our hearts, to protect us from our outward or inward pimples, to protect us from any of the vices that we may have, and to help us become more beautiful human beings, to help us become vessels of beauty, vessels of light, so that we can help others enjoy, bring joy into people's lives. We ask you, God, to help us in our matters, and bring harmony and serenity and tranquility into our selves and into our marriages and into our families and into our homes and into our communities and into our country and into our continents and into this world. We ask you to accept this from us and to, and to forgive all of us and to, and to bless this community center, MCC East Bay, and to bless Pleasanton and to bless the cities around here. And we thank you for the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our wealth. We thank you for our safety and for our security. And we thank you for the food that you gift us. And we ask you to make us grateful servants. Amen, amen, amen. And we ask you to send peace and blessings and mercy to all of the prophets and messengers that you sent to mankind. All of them, Adam and Noah and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and all of them. We ask you to gather us with them in heaven without judgment. Amin. Subhan rabbika rabbil azati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be to you.